Well, good day, everybody. Thanks so much for being with me again this week. I just pray God's blessings upon you. And uh, you know what? As we begin, uh, like I do every week, I always say, join with me in prayer. And let's ask the Lord to lead us and guide us uh, in everything that we're doing, because we're here to serve Him and to love Him and to worship Him. Um, one more thing that, uh, that I would ask you do with me right now. Uh, I was given a prayer request this week, and uh, I, I want to make sure that that we reach out and we actually do pray for those that are reaching out because um, in this season, uh, at the end of the day, it's all about giving, and uh, Christ gave everything for us. So the least we can do is lift one another up in prayer. And uh, of course, we know Pastor Bob uh, is still healing uh, he's still coming through his ordeal so we want to continue to pray god's blessings upon him and he continues to be strengthened and uh, that all sickness departs from his body but uh, i want you to join with me if you've got uh, a loved one beside you grab their hand and uh, you know just agree with me uh, my friend mary reached out to me and uh, she's going through some some health issues um, i don't want to go into it too much there you know just out of respect for for who she is and uh, I just I had asked uh, if we could come together and pray and uh, she did say yes so um, we're just going to pray for her body that it's completely restored in the name of Jesus and uh, thank God that we know that Christ did it all on the cross of Calvary so let's go to him first and let's uh, ask him for his blessing so father we thank you for your grace we thank you for your mercy we thank you for your loving touch upon us we don't deserve it in any way, shape, or form, but Lord, you and your great, awesome love uh, so willingly gave your life on the cross of Calvary for us, and uh, through you, we've got everything. We don't have to strive for anything because it's all in you. All we need to do is look to the cross and look to you, and so Jesus, we come before you, and we just lay our all at your very feet. And uh, we ask, Lord, for your blessings, for your leading and for your guiding for this study tonight and upon each and every life, oh God. Um, it's listening within the sound of my voice right now. God, I just pray a release of your Holy Spirit into that room, oh God, that you would touch them and fill them, oh Lord, and bless them abundantly. Show them, oh God, how much you love them. And Lord, I pray your awesome fire in their life, oh God. And Lord, I, I lift up Pastor Bob right now, and we ask, oh God, for an extra touch upon his body. Continue to heal him, Lord. We thank you, oh God, for your touch upon him already, and we just thank you, oh God, for what you're going to do. And upon my friend Mary, oh Lord, I pray, God, that you touch her heart. God, I pray that you heal it completely. God, I pray that you move with your mighty miracle-working power and that you do all that you can do, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, oh God, touch her body. Make it whole, O oh God, from the top of her head down to the very tips of her feet. And may this year, O oh God, be a marked year of blessing, O oh God, because we have come together in unity and we have come together to lift up brothers and sisters, O oh God. And so thank you, Lord Jesus, for your touch. Thank you for healing. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your wonderful, wonderful love. I bless everybody, O oh God, that's listening, O oh Lord. And we just ask that you would just release the Holy Spirit to teach us, O oh God, from your word. Teach us, O oh Lord, and to draw closer to you. Teach us to see you for who you really are. Lord, we love you, we bless you, we honor you, and we thank you for this night. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, guys, I, uh, I decided, well, I'd get a song first of all, because uh, I know that some uh, that are listening, they like some of these old songs, and uh, so I picked out another one here, and uh, hopefully, it's one that you know. Um, we haven't really sang it in a while. It's my savior, first of all. And uh, it's been quite some time since I sang this old Fanny Crosby song. So if you don't like it, uh, skip on through. That's just as easy as that and with technology and with YouTube and Facebook and all that kind of good stuff. So let's see if I can get this here. When my life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. 
I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeem by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the prints of the nails in his hands. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeem by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the prints of the nails in his hands. Oh, bless God, we shall know him, we shall know him, hallelujah, we shall know him. He is awesome in every single way, and when we get to see him, oh, what a day that's going to be. Oh, man. Uh, you know what? Maybe we should just sing that song right there. What a day that shall be. It's been a while since we sung that one, you know. What a day that shall be When my Jesus I shall see When I look upon his face The one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my jesus i shall see when i look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through that promised land what a day glorious day that will be hallelujah Bless God for his touch. Oh, glory, glory, glory to his name. Hey, you know what? I was also, I was going through the old hymn book here, and I came across another one that says, Nothing But the Blood. And uh, I, you know what? I, I know that there's lots of times the preachers are getting out there, and they're not really talking about the blood of Jesus. But let me tell you, when we, the blood of Jesus is really what matters. It's not something that's, um, well, it, it's not something that, looks really spectacular when you're trying to present it but you know what the cold hard facts is that the blood of the lamb was spilt the blood of the holy lamb of god was spilt upon the cross of calvary for you and for i so that our sins can be washed away amen amen so that, let's just sing a couple of verses out of this one what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank God for his precious blood. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Well, you know what? Um, it's getting pretty close to the Christmas season, so I thought, well, uh, why don't we try and, and talk about something that, uh, that happened during that Christmas time and um, see if you can get where we're going with this from this song. Star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Well, you got it. If you, uh, if you knew that song, and uh, we three kings of Orient are. And uh, one of the things that uh, the Lord kind of impressed upon me a couple of weeks ago was to uh, take a look at this star. Now, I was kind of hesitant in some ways to go through this. Uh, there's some things that might be a little bit controversial about it, but uh, hey, you know what? I've never been one to kind of run away from any uh, controversy before. So let me see if I can do this uh, for you tonight and, uh, uh, you know, put some of the word of God to it and uh, hopefully now make it sound kind of hokey pokey, shall we say. Bless God. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the book of Matthew and we're going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going to go with this. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 10. And said, now, this is a familiar story. Probably everybody knows of it, and that's okay. We're just going to uh, go through here, and uh, we'll just kind of see where the Lord leads us. It says, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east traveled, or sorry, traveled from the east, arrived in Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and gathered together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, and began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judah, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I may too may come and worship him. And having heard the king, they went on their way. And lo, the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they had saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So I, I went and I looked at this story and, um, and I got thinking when I was going through this, these are the wise men. And one of the things that really kind of popped out was this star. And, and I've always been kind of fascinated with this um, astrological sign, shall we say. And so I wanted to go and, and do a little bit of research on this. And first thing I want to do is I want you to look in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 14, which I find this very, very interesting now. So if we go to Genesis chapter 1 and 14, it says this. It says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So the first thing that kind of grabbed me when I was looking at this is, Let it be for signs. Now, Here's where it gets kind of hokey pokey, 
shall we say. And I want to be very clear as to what I'm saying when I go through this. The devil never creates. The devil always takes something that God creates and twists it, turns it, taints it, and, and causes it to be something uh, that would deceive people. But within everything that the devil tries to do, God has already established truth. So one of the things that we need to recognize from the word of God is that God created the heavens and the earth. God created the stars. And it says in the word that God made the stars for signs. All right. So when we want to go back through history here, and we, when we want to look at this, we need to recognize here that the devil will take the things in the stars and he twists it and he turns it. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at today, where's the easiest thing that you come up with, with uh, stars and signs? Well, it's the horoscopes, right? Or horoscopes, whichever you prefer. Um, within that element of what was going on with all of that that astrology stuff we have to recognize that god was already doing something in the heavens so there's already a pointing so i want to be very clear here when i'm saying this i am not talking about astrology i'm not talking about horoscopes okay so i am talking about the word of god i'm talking about his creation that he has made now we need to recognize that these are wise men. Why are they wise men? So I began to do a little bit of research on this. And hopefully, I'm not going to bore you with any of this. Um, and at the end of the day, if this kind of does bore you, you know what? Shut it off. Move on. Um, and again, I'm going to try and do my best to work through some of this. And again, if I mess up, I'm sorry. We'll try again next week. So... First thing we want to recognize is that magi are wise men. They're intelligent. Now, they are probably, probably astrologers or mathematicians. So when you really go into the depths of our universe, there is um, there's a, a great amount of mathematical equations that exist within our universe. And let me tell you something. I'm not that smart at this particular point in time to be able to digest all of that information and be able to regurgitate it back to you in a very simplistic form. Matter of fact, probably some of you out there that are listening are far more intelligent than I am and could be able to, um, you know, give a, um, give a symposium on all that and, uh, you know, I would be in awe at your knowledge and how you're presenting that. So for this particular case, we're just going to go with the really smart guys in probably the astrology and mathematical side of things. So we would look at them and say they're probably like astrophysicists. Uh, we would recognize those guys going to the moon. Uh, astronauts are very intelligent people. They've got to know lots of math. They've got to know lots of things like that. We're going to put the magi, these wise men, probably into the same category. So one of the things that I found was very, very interesting as they're going through when they began to look at uh, when they began to look at the stars in the heavens this was not something that um, they were unprepared for so if we were to go into the book of Daniel so if we went to Daniel chapter 9 and we started in verse number 24 this particular verse that, uh, that the Word of God is talking about is talking about the coming of the Messiah. So it says this, 70 weeks has been a decree for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make an atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will build again with plaza and mode and even times of distress, 
Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. I'm going to keep that in mind here. We cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who has come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now I want to stop right there. I'm not going to go deep into prophetic words here. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I also don't want to go into a point where we're where we're sitting back and we're basically saying, well, let's exegeticalize the scripture and discuss the theological ramifications. And All right. So it doesn't, we can do that, but we're not going to get into that because at the end of the day, what we want to try and do is we want to try and understand Jesus. We want to try and see where Jesus is here. So in the book of Daniel, it's talking about the Messiah. And in here, it happens to give a time frame here. So it's 70 weeks, all right? Or the other one here is uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks. So what we need to understand is when we are looking at those type of uh, numbers, when we look at Jewish culture, Jewish people would understand that um, a week has seven. They recognize when you talk about 70 weeks, it's talking about 70 times 7, okay? So it's not talking about 70 alone. It's talking about 70 times 7 weeks, which equates to 490. It's important to recognize that because what happens here within the Bible, it's talking about there's a time when the Messiah is cut off. The cutting off that the Word of God is talking about here is the death of the Messiah. So, these guys being wise men can recognize this very thing. They can recognize that from the time that Daniel has spoken these words, at that particular point in time, which was about 445 BC, somewhere around there, and, um, and then it goes to the time of cutoff, which was uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks. So, from that point to the time of the death of the Messiah, they can count, they can count that, that time frame. And from the death of the Messiah, they recognize that Jesus or the Messiah is going to be a high priest. Well, how do I know that? Well, because it says this in the book of, oh, where are we here? Uh, it says this in the book of Numbers. And Numbers 4 and 43 says this. And I'll show you just one of the things that it has to include. Because it talks about, where are we here? Sorry about this. It talks about the age that a priest has to be. So if we go at verse number 42, and the numbered men of the families, the sons of Miri, Miri, sorry, forgive me on that one, by their families and by their family's household, from 30 years and upwards even to 50 years, everyone who entered the service for work in the tent of the meeting. So what that means is this is talking about the, uh, this is talking about the priests, anybody that is doing service. So they had to be 30 years of age, up to 50. That was the time frame that they, that they had to be in. So the wise men recognized that from the death of the priest that was coming, they could count backwards from that time frame. So there's also, how do they know that it was going to be, um, how do they know it was going to be the most high priest? Because in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 35, it says, I will raise up myself a faithful priest. So what it's talking about here, these wise men understood the scriptures. They understood the time frame. They understood what Daniel was talking about. They went forward all those years, and they went back at least 30. So they recognize now that there's something that's happening. So when they began to look into the heavens, they understood that there were some things that were happening that, about this star. Now, it says that, uh, it, it doesn't say in here scripture, but there are other documents that say that these, these men, these magi, would have come from a place called Mesopotamia. And so they came to the east. Now, why did they come from the east? So, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, and I want to try and do my best here, because we need to recognize 
that there's a little bit of, of um, basic astrology that we need to understand here. Um, and so, when we begin to look at that, we recognize that stars rise and set. We understand that when that happens, it's because the Earth, it's because the moon, the planets begin to move. So what actually happens is planets are actually referred to as wandering stars, in, especially in Greek theology. But even though we, we recognize that stars rise and set, it's actually within the very human existence, stars basically stay in the same spot. Now, how do we know that? Because when you look outside of the Big Dipper, the Big Dipper pretty much stays in the same spot all the time. It's just the Earth and its rotation that changes that. Excuse me. So, what we need to understand is that in Greek astrology, when a planet begins to reappear after being hidden and begins to rise just before the morning sun, it's known as this. It's known as a helical rising. Okay, so it's very important. So in the Greek, it's referred to as an en, en, ente anatole. So E N T E A N A T O L E. So what what that is is that's called a helical rising. And so Jupiter was known as the um, the father planet at that particular point in time. So what happened was if you go back in history and begin to look at all of the um, astrological signs that were going on at that particular point in time, you can find that Jupiter was one of these planets that was having a rising. And so it would be hidden and then you would see it in the morning sun for just a minute and it would rise in the east. When Jupiter began to rise, it was, it was known that somebody of significance was going to be born. So, this is something that began to happen, and the wise men understood this. So they were looking at all these things that were going on in the heavens. When we get to verse number 9 in Matthew, it says that the star stood over the child. Well, how did all this happen? Well, we're not going to get into all of the mathematical stuff that goes on there. But realistically speaking, what happens is because the Earth begins to move round and round and round, what happens is these planets, they don't travel all at the same speed. So as things begin to come into alignment, we would understand that as being an eclipse. Or one of these things that begins to happen is these risings in the east. So as these risings began to happen, they began to come into alignment with some of the other planets. So at the time of Jesus' birth, what you can find is that there is not only one planet that's coming into alignment, but several. And I thought this was interesting that during this Christmas season that God would do something absolutely amazing in the heavens like only God can do. So what happens is Jupiter begins to come. So now what they're seeing is that Jupiter being the father or kingly planet is beginning to rise. So what they're now saying is that there is a king that is coming upon the scene. So this strikes their attention. The other one that happens to come into alignment now is the planet of Venus. Venus, we know, uh, represents the motherhood. So what happens is now you've got the king coming into alignment with the, the brightest planet, which is Venus. Now it's coming into alignment and it's making a, an even brighter sign in the heavens. So now this is catching their eye because there's something that's beginning to happen as these planets begin to move. Not only that, but now you've got another one that's coming in, and it's part of the uh, Leo the Lion. So we've heard about that one. So Leo the Lion comes out of Israel. That's where the lion represents. So now what they're seeing is now they're coming to Israel. They're coming to Judea. From the, from the, from the east, they're coming 
to Israel because now they recognize that there is a kingly planet, there's a bright planet from the mother that's coming in board. It's now in alignment with Leo the Lion coming out of Israel. And not only that, but now there is another constellation that is coming into alignment called Regalus. And Regalus is, um, it's in reference to royalty. So now what's happened is you've got um, this kingship, you've got this motherhood, you've got it coming out of Israel, and you've got royalty that's all being lined up. And what that represented to these wise men was not only was there being a king that was being born, but there is somebody that was going to be a king of kings. And so out of all of that, they're looking at this saying, we've got to go and see because we've never seen anything like this. Now they would recognize because they're wise and intelligent men. I think that they probably have been taught the scriptures. And so when we recognize in Proverbs 1 and 7, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then if we look in Proverbs 9 and 10, it says the same thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I absolutely believe that the alignment of these stars, the mathematical equations that were going on, the improbability of all these things coming into alignment during the time of the birth of Jesus, these guys would recognize this, they got, these guys would understand this, this would produce um, the culmination of Jupiter being this great the biggest planet there is in alignment with the brightest planet of Venus coming into alignment out of Israel and into alignment with the, the constellation of, of Regalus, they would recognize that this alignment of stars is producing a light that is going to be pretty great. Um, now, one of the things that I found interesting was that when they got to Herod, and they said, we followed his star. They didn't understand what they were looking at. They didn't see what was going on. So I don't know if it produced something that was directly above them that they would see that or not. There's nothing, there's nothing to indicate that. All it indicates is that it came from the east. And there's lots of information on this. And I, I'm trying to be as basic and as simplistic as I can here. Lots of times we think that it produces this, this great blinding light. Well, how many times do we look outside and we see these awesome stars out there and, and some of the things that are going on and we say, wow, that's fantastic, it's marvelous, it's awesome. But do we end up following those things? No, not likely, because we don't understand it. The thing that I want to point people to at this particular point right now is right to Jesus. Jesus is the bright and morning star. Jesus is the one where this light shone. And these guys had the understanding to take the scriptures, to take what creation was giving to them and, and pointed them right to Jesus. See, at the end of the day, that's where it all comes back to. It all comes back to Jesus. It doesn't matter what's going on in this world. It doesn't matter what's going on in our lives. Even when there's chaos, Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one that provides the answers to the mysteries. Jesus is the one that provides wisdom. Jesus is the one that provides guidance because he is the light. He is the bright and morning star. Hallelujah. And you know what? At the end of the day, they, King Herod was so blinded that even though there's all this going on, he still didn't understand it. But yet these wise men had the foresight that had the understanding. And that's why it's important to take the scriptures. It's important to dive into them. It's important to, uh, to learn from them. It's important to find Jesus in the scriptures. Well, sometimes you can't do it, but by the power of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes you can't do it. As a matter of fact, you can't do it at all without the revelation of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what any preacher says. It doesn't matter what anybody says on the internet. If the Holy Ghost doesn't reveal the Word of God to you, and let it be seated within you, I'm telling you, it doesn't mean anything. It's important. And the one thing that I want to impress upon you is take the Word of God. I pray that at some point that these Bible studies are causing you to dive deeper into the Word. I pray that at some point these Bible studies are causing you to seek the Lord's face. I pray that at some point these Bible studies are encouraging you to call unto Him. You know what? This 
this actually gets so deep into some areas that, that it's actually beyond my mind. And, uh, you know, we could be mushed <laughs> talking about all the different uh, equations and things that happened in the past and things that have been written down. But I found it interesting that the King of Kings allowed all of creation to come into alignment. Makes sense. But sometimes it's just nice to see in the Word of God exactly what he's doing. And uh, it doesn't talk too much about these wise men. But you know what? An angel showed up to him afterwards. Didn't send him back to Herod. So God cared for these men. These men came to worship the king. How much more do we, who maybe not, are not as wise, but yet we need to come and worship the king. That's what it all comes down to. Worshiping Jesus. And I'm so glad that I have an opportunity to come and to teach his word and to share with you, to bless you, and to be blessed. You know what? I, I can't thank you enough for allowing me um, the time to, to come to, with you every week to, to sing and to worship, to praise and to dive into his word. You know, you've, you've given me a chance. And I'm so grateful and I'm so thankful to dive deeper into the word than I've, than I've really... <laughs> It's been quite some time since I've, I've had to dive into the Word. Because I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there are people that are listening to me that are far more intelligent than I am. And I certainly don't want to waste your time with anything. I want to bless you. And I thank you for uh, being gracious with me, patient, and uh, for your encouragement. And uh, so for that, I bless you. And I thank you so much for, for doing that. You know what? Uh, one thing that uh, was kind of impressed upon me is that if you ever want to do something, start to teach it. If if you want to if you want to play an instrument, go ahead and teach it, and guarantee you it'll cause you to learn it a whole lot faster. If you want to teach the Word of God, dive into it and just start teaching. Just start sharing what God has given to you. Start blessing people. I pray in the name of Jesus that you have been blessed this week. I pray that in the name of Jesus in this Christmas season coming up, that your focus is pointed right to that bright and morning star, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that he will touch you. I pray that he will release his holy presence into your room, into your life. I pray that if there's anybody that is uh, going through issues, during this season, I pray that the Lord's peace would just rest upon you. I thank you for your time. I uh, just speak God's blessing upon you. Guys, I love you, and I pray that you have a Merry Christmas. In Jesus' name.